My name is Shana McCormick. I'm an endocrinologist at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and I'm grateful to collaborate with the Mitochondrial Medicine Frontier Program in providing endocrine care for children affected by mitochondrial disorders. My talk is entitled Endocrinology and Mitochondrial Disease. As this group well knows, mitochondrial disease impacts endocrine function in many ways, and multiple different endocrine disorders have been associated with primary mitochondrial disease. Certain subtypes of mitochondrial disease, whether genetic or phenotypic, are associated with increased likelihoods of endocrine disease. And this phenomenon is illustrated very well by the schematic at right, where you can see the range of endocrine organs from hypothalamus, pituitary, parathyroid, thyroid, pancreas, adrenal, ovary, and testes that are affected by disorders affecting the mitochondria. This schematic also shows the variety of endocrine disorders and the genetic defects in mitochondria that have been associated with them. So the goal of today's talk is to introduce you to several of the most common disorders impacting individuals with mitochondrial disease and sharing resources for you in thinking about diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment of those conditions. Our team has ex explored the prevalence of endocrine disorders in primary mitochondrial disease using the North American Mitochondrial Disease Consortium. One of our trainees, Iman Algadi, led this work. She examined 404 children and adults with molecular diagnoses of mitochondrial disease, and she found that several endocrine diagnoses were particularly prevalent in this cohort including atypical growth and sexual maturation, which was present in nearly half the group, diabetes mellitus affected at least 1 in 10, and hypothyroidism was prevalent around the same order that's present in the general population. Other endocrine diagnoses were also noted at varying frequencies that are really important to clinical care and to patient health and safety. And these include hypoglycemia, adrenal insufficiency, hypoparathyroidism, and impaired bone health, or osteoporosis. For the next phase of the talk, I'm going to review several of these conditions in a bit more detail. One important problem in many individuals with mitochondrial disorders is problems of glucose homeostasis. This schematic shows one way in which I think about these problems. So individuals who are healthy without mitochondrial disease can tolerate a wide range of nutrient availability. If nutrients are limited, they can maintain safe blood sugars. And also, if nutrients are available and in excess, they're not typically predisposed to higher blood sugars. In contrast, individuals with mitochondrial disorders are more fragile, and there's a more narrow range of acceptable nutrient availability. If there isn't enough energy available, folks with mitochondrial disease can be more prone to low blood sugars. Also, if there's excess nutrition available, higher blood sugars or diabetes can be a problem. Both high and low blood sugars are detectable and treatable and can impact patient health and function, so are important focuses of evaluation. Uh, we begin with hypoglycemia, so low blood sugar, and we use as a threshold for hypoglycemia, blood sugar less than 70, and more severe hypoglycemia, blood sugar less than 50 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, the first step, of course, is to detect this using finger stick blood sugar monitoring or continuous glucose monitoring in some circumstances. The evaluation includes looking for treatable causes of low blood sugar, for example, hormone deficiencies like cortisol deficiency or malnutrition leading to limited glucose stores. Treatment is also very important. Providing dextrose in the form of D10 or other carbohydrate is typically our initial first step with the goal of reversing catabolic processes. Ideally, the blood sugar treatment plan is developed in collaboration with the endocrinologist and the mitochondrial disease specialist before the patient is in trouble. And the emergency letter that we provide to patients typically includes guidance on how to check blood sugars and what to do if blood sugars are low. And then over time, as we gain experience with how patients respond to the emergency plan, we adapt this accordingly. At the other extreme, mitochondrial diabetes can also be a problem. Mitochondrial diabetes 
is caused by a combination of insulin deficiency and insulin resistance. And each of these contributes to differing extents in individual patients. Insulin secretion is affected in individuals with mitochondrial diabetes because insulin secretion requires mitochondrial ATP production in the beta cell. Insulin resistance can occur in the setting of mitochondrial disease for reasons that we are investigating, but likely related to impaired fuel utilization. It's imperative to educate patients regarding symptoms of uncontrolled high blood sugars, including excess urination and thirst. It's also appropriate to screen individuals annually. We manage mitochondrial diabetes in an individualized way based on our understanding of patients' physiology. We also ensure we measure both blood sugar and blood ketones given the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis in many individuals. We select medications based on physiology as well as comorbidities and the risk for off-target effects. I'm showing you this schematic from a Young et al. article published this year that I really like because it captures the importance of considering both insulin deficiency and insulin resistance in selection of therapy. For individuals with clear evidence of insulin deficiency, for example, ketoacidosis or low C-peptide or weight loss with hyperglycemia, insulin is a cornerstone of therapy. For individuals in whom insulin resistance may predominate, it may be appropriate to choose newly available other agents for treating diabetes. However, it's very important to be mindful of the potential off-target effects of those medications. Also, individuals with mitochondrial diabetes deserve uh, to be offered the newest in diabetes technology, including systems for monitoring blood sugar and subcutaneous insulin pump administration. Switching gears from blood sugar to cortisol, adrenal insufficiency is a problem that can occur and can be life-threatening. To remind the group, Cortisol is produced in response to stressors including hypoglycemia, hypotension, surgery, fever, and other injuries as a result of signaling that originates in the hypothalamus and pituitary. Mitochondria are critical for steroid synthesis and in individuals with mitochondrial disorders, both primary and secondary forms of in adrenal insufficiency have been found. Symptoms of adrenal insufficiency are those you might expect given the known physiologic functions of cortisol and include low blood sugar, low blood pressure, and low sodium levels, especially in the setting of a stress such as critical illness. With respect to screening and management, we typically screen for problems related to adrenal insufficiency with 8 a.m. measurements of ACTH and cortisol. We do this specific time of day testing because cortisol is a diurnal hormone. We may also choose to measure aldosterone and renin levels as well as an adrenal androgen, DHEAS. This is because in individuals in particular with primary adrenal insufficiency, other adrenal hormone deficiencies may be present. And to remind you, I've shown you an anatomic slice of the adrenal cortex and medulla to show that in addition to glucocorticoids, adrenal glands produce mineralocorticoids, androgens, and the medulla produces catecholamines, and deficiencies of all of these can occur. Decisions around the replacement of adrenal hormones depend, of course, on which deficiencies are present. For glucocorticoid deficiency, hydrocortisone and prednisone are appropriate. For mineralocorticoids, deficiency, fludrocortisone is used. We, our goal is to recapitulate daily hormone fluctuations and also to provide additional steroids when needed in this setting of physiologic stress. We also need to be mindful of potential adverse effects of excess steroid administration, uh, which is called iatrogenic Cushing's. Another potentially life-threatening problem in mitochondrial disorders are problems with calcium homeostasis. To remind you of the physiology, calcium levels in the body are regulated by the parathyroid hormone. And in some mitochondrial disorders, in particular Kern-Sayer, 
low parathyroid hormone levels can occur. These can be either reflective of primary hypothyroidism and or the effect of low magnesium levels, which can occur from renal magnesium wasting. And when magnesium is lost by the kidney, that adversely affects both PTH secretion and action, which makes maintaining normal calcium levels difficult. Symptoms of low calcium levels can include muscle weakness, abnormal heart rhythms, and seizures, and these can even be life-threatening. However, disorders of calcium homeostasis are eminently treatable. Hypoparathyroidism is treated with calcium and activated vitamin D, calcitriol, and if low magnesium contributes to the physiology, then magnesium replacement is appropriate as well. Related to calcium, bone health is an important consideration in individuals with primary mitochondrial disorders. This paper was written by another of our trainees, Shifa Gandhi, who examined a cohort of individuals at CHOP with mitochondrial disorders and found, which resonated with our clinical intuition, that individuals had multiple risk factors for fragile bones. And these included, of course, the chronic illness itself, being immobile and not walking, malnutrition, acidosis, diabetes and kidney disease, GI problems that contribute to poor absorption of vitamin D, which is important for bone health, anti-epileptic medications, with, which affect vitamin D metabolism and bone health, as well as endocrine hormone deficiencies, including growth thyroid and sex steroid deficiencies. With respect to bone health, bone mineral density is assessed via a DEXA scan, dual energy x-ray absorptiometry. This scan measures bone density. However, it does have some limitations and doesn't fully capture the risk of fracture, which is the clinically relevant consequence of impaired bone health. Patient history is really important, assessing for risk factors for low bone health. With respect to management, in all of our patients, we like to optimize calcium and vitamin D intake. The Institute of Medicine reference guidelines for calcium and vitamin D are shown here. It's also imperative that we help them avoid falls and other injuries and provide physical therapy in a way that's mindful of potential fragile bones. There are more and more medications available for individuals who do have fragile bones that can prevent fractures, and these medications are underutilized both in the general population and likely in our patients as well. I've provided you here with a link to patient resources as well as the endocrine um, society's revised osteoporosis guidelines that you can use as a reference. Switching gears from bone health, thyroid problems are common both in the general population and can also occur in individuals with mitochondrial disorders. The symptoms of low thyroid function or high thyroid function are relatively nonspecific and include fatigue, temperature intolerance, so intolerance of extremes of either cold or hot, and change in bowel habits. Thyroid function can be assessed by measuring thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH, free thyroxine, free T4, and if hyperthyroidism is suspected, T3, a different form of thyroid hormone. To remind you of the different forms of thyroid dysfunction, I've shown you this schematic from the American Thyroid Association, which outlines the abnormalities that we observe in different forms of thyroid abnormalities, including hyperthyroidism, where excess thyroid hormone is produced, primary hypothyroidism, which is hypothyroidism driven by problems with the gland itself, as well as secondary hypothyroidism, which is driven by problems with the pituitary. If thyroid hormone levels are low, replacement thyroid hormone is available. Other considerations when measuring thyroid hormone levels are the effect of intercurrent illness and stress. So illness and stress themselves can affect thyroid hormone measurements and can add complexity to the decision as to whether to offer replacement. Another sex, uh, hormone deficiency that can occur is sex steroid deficiency, so either estrogen or testosterone, depending on the patient's sex. Symptoms of deficiency are sex-dependent, but include sexual function in both men and women and low bone health. Assessment of this axis includes measurement of FSH, LH, which are the pituitary hormones governing sex steroid production, 
estradiol and testosterone. Management, of course, depends on the etiology, but there are multiple replacement strategies for each of these hormones. There are adverse effects related to excess hormone administration, so these must be borne in mind. And again, the www.hormone.org website is a helpful resource for patients to review the symptoms of low sex steroids. One very important dimension of endocrine health in individuals with mitochondrial disorders is growth. Childhood growth requires energy, and that's shown here in this schematic, where on the x-axis is age in years, and on the y-axis is energy requirement in kilocalories per kilo per day. And you can appreciate that in youngest children, in toddlers and going through school age and puberty, energy requirements are substantially higher than they are in adulthood. And much of this increased energy requirement is, of course, for sustaining growth. Mitochondria are critical for transforming nutrition into usable energy. In the study I cited that we did previously, 58% of children had abnormal growth or maturation, and that resonates with our clinical experience as well. There are multiple causes of potential impaired growth in individuals with mitochondrial disease. Of course, malnutrition or problems with absorption of nutrients is one major cause. Growth hormone deficiency can exist. Other endocrine disorders, including hypothyroidism or sex steroid deficiency, also impact growth. One interesting question that arises in the care of individuals with mitochondrial disorders is to what extent decreased growth is an adaptive compensatory response to energy deficiency. And the example of GDF-15 is sometimes offered when making this point. GDF-15 is a hormone that has been identified as a potential biomarker of mitochondrial disease that also affects energy balance across a range of conditions. Uh, Rebecca Ganetsky and Ibrahim George Sanko, examining data from the CHOP Mitochondrial Medicine Frontier Program, identified that in individuals who had higher levels of GDF-15, whether they are adults, here in red, or children, here in blue, had a lower height z-score. In other words, they were shorter than a reference population. The reference population has an average height z-score of zero, and you can see that the higher the GDF-15 level in a given individual, the shorter they were relative to their age and sex matched peers. And this could reflect the body's response to energy stress. The treatment of impaired growth in individuals is of course focused on addressing the underlying cause. Another problem that we can observe, and particularly in older adolescents and adults with mitochondrial disorders, is actually excess weight gain. This can be a problem because obesity is prevalent in the general population and then also prevalent in adults with mitochondrial disorders. The same risk factors that exist in the general population, of course, contribute in adults with mitochondrial disease. But there are also other factors that perpetuate energy imbalance. In particular, weight gain can make physical activity more difficult, as can disease severity, which of course leads to more difficulty with activity and more weight gain. This is illustrated by a schematic here, developed by a Pabhai and colleagues, that shows on the x-axis the clinical severity of disease and on the y-axis the number of steps that the individuals walk per day. And you can see individuals with more severe disease are less likely to move adequately. And in this study, that was shown to contribute to excess weight gain. Individualized recommendations for nutrition and physical therapy may be helpful. In one interventional study, for example, patients with mitochondrial disorders were provided individualized counseling focused on either affecting strength, minimizing GI complaints, or affecting body composition, and there was success found in meeting individual goals in response to these interventions. So in summary, I've given you a brief introduction to the range of endocrine disorders that are prevalent in individuals with mitochondrial disorders. We recommend that evidence-supported and symptom-directed patient screening is pursued in these individuals 
and we're hopeful that those types of that type of screening identifies opportunities for effective interventions that help our patients be as healthy and as functional as possible. I really appreciate your attention and I'm happy to take any questions.